Warning! Tube amplifiers have lethal voltages inside them. Please do not attempt to build, test, or repair these without understanding and following all safety protocols. Hey y'all! Well, we're here for something that a lot of you have been asking about for a long time. This is uh, a Wilsonton R8 that we've got on the bench. And a friend of mine bought one of these through a problem with his house wiring, not a problem with the amp. It was a problem with this house wiring that caused this. Had a tube red plate, burned up the cathode resistor, and hopefully there wasn't any other damage besides that. So we're going to get this thing repaired, get it checked out. We're going to check all the voltages, then run the audio analyzer suite on it and see what kind of performance this thing has. This is advertised a 45 watt amp. I've got no idea whether that's exactly what it makes or, you know, some of these other... Rice song amps we've checked, they're not even close to what they're advertised. And the Noob Sound 6P1, another amp that was claimed to be 6 watts and it's less than 2. So hopefully that's not what we run into with this amp. So anyway, let's get to doing the repair and doing the analysis of this amp. And then we'll do a follow-up at the end of the video. So let's get busy. Okay, here we are diving into the inside of this R8, and first looking over this amp, it looks really well laid out. Now, I'm not a real fan of, you know, like the way they've zip tied this stuff all together, but I guess using stranded wire, that's the only way they can do this and keep it neat. One thing that is not real good, although probably not as big an issue in a push-pull amp, is when you're running wires parallel this close to each other you can end up with crosstalk between the wires but we'll see if that's an issue or not when we get deeper into this project also these wires going to the grids with the signal path are smaller than I would normally use yeah there's not a lot of current going through them but you don't really want to see at least in my opinion wires this small with the signal going through them for this long a distance there might be a little bit of you know signal loss in that I it's probably more just you know my thinking of just why not use bigger wire what are you really saving you're not trying to like make this amp lightweight because it already weighs a ton does use a choke in the power supply which is nice one of the things that I've done some research on you know, with other people that have worked on this amp, because obviously these things been out for a while. A lot of people are saying these two big power supply filter caps are really pushing it being rated at 450 volts, especially when the power supply comes up as fast as it would on a solid state rectified power supply, because here's your little bridge rectifier that they use for the power supply. And so did some research and found these Cornell Dubler caps on Mauser that are the exact same outside diameter so they'll bolt right in the clamps here and they're about five millimeters longer but they're the same 330 UF value but they're 550 volts so that's something we're going to be upgrading in here what happened to this amp was the house that this amp was being used at the neutral on the power going to the house went open and what that does is the house then starts trying to balance the two 120 volt halves of the power there's 240 volts coming in off a center tap transformer when you lose the center tap then those channels are you know you know one side and the other of the 240 volt they try to start balancing each other out so what happens is if one side gets a heavy load on it like the heater comes on or the dryer comes on or some other appliance that uses a lot of current that side the voltage drops and then the other side of the breaker box goes up well this amp happened to be hooked up to the side of the breaker box that didn't have a lot of high current stuff on it so that when the air conditioner came on or even something like the refrigerator kicked on it would make the voltage on this side of the breaker box skyrocket and we saw 
almost 150 volts at times on the outlet feeding this amplifier. So through no fault of this amp, it was getting severely overvolted. One of the tubes red plated and it fried the cathode resistor. And let me zoom in here and show you what happened here. And you can see this resistor here, especially this one here, but also this resistor here got cooked. And this is a really good design that they did here. They use a 10 ohm resistor on the cathode to the ground and they sized this where this resistor basically acts like a fuse. So if the tube red plates or the current goes through the moon, instead of cooking the output transformer, hopefully it just blew this resistor out and saved the amp. So what we've got to do in this episode is we need to replace this 10 ohm resistor and we're going to go ahead and replace this resistor going over the screen as well, probably both of these, and then put the tubes back in it, power it up, check the bias, and then run some tests on this amp and see what kind of a baseline measurement is. So having a channel in the amp that's undamaged, I can then test one channel against the other channel on the audio analyzer suite and make sure that no damage was done to the output transformer and that both channels are you know performing like they should now obviously the tube that red plated is no longer a viable tube i have some gold lion kt88s and my plan is to put my good gold lion tubes on this channel that was undamaged and we'll put the stock willitson tubes that came with the amp in this channel that we've repaired just in case there is something wrong still I won't cook my nice KT88 gold lion tubes and then when we do the testing I'll go I'll swap and use the same tubes at each channel so we make sure that we're getting you know the same performance or the same equal kind of measurement we're not just testing you know one brand of tubes versus another some other things that I noticed besides these big power capacitors, and I don't know about you guys, but when I see made in China amps that have caps that have Nikicon labels on them, I don't know if they're really Nikicon capacitors or whether they, somebody just stuck labels on them. We see a lot of that with some made in China products, like you'll see stuff that claims to have like 3M adhesive tape on it when there's no way that it's actual, you know, high quality 3M tape. The other thing that I'm not real crazy about is these appear to be metal oxide resistors that they've used in all the signal path parts of the amp. Now some of the parts over here, these are, looks like metal film resistors. They may be carbon film resistors, I'm not sure. But these all look like metal oxide resistors. And typically those are fairly normal resistors. And let me see if I can zoom in on this resistor over here. Okay, check out this resistor right here. Okay, this isn't on a blown channel, but look how the ceramic stuff is coming off of this resistor. There's several resistors that look like that throughout this amp. Now, I would normally say, okay, this is due to this thing being overvolted, but in doing some research on this amp, I've heard quite a few people questioning these resistors with the ceramic peeling off of them or cracking off of them. So after we do our initial tests on this amp, I'm going to come back through and I've ordered a whole set of Viché 2 watt metal film resistors, high quality, that I'm going to replace all of these metal oxide resistors throughout the amp with. On the cathode resistors, I specifically got some super precision 10 ohm resistors that are 0.5% rated so that I know that when we're setting the bias on these tubes, because we're using these resistors as a shunt for the meter to show us the bias setting. And if these are off, you know, even 0.3 of an ohm, it's going to give you pretty wildly different readings on the meter when you're trying to bias these tubes. So I wanted to make sure that all of these 10 ohm resistors are exactly 10 ohms. The other thing that I want to do is measure the actual millivolt drop across these versus what the meter is showing and then calculate up 
exactly how many milliamps of current we're pulling off these tubes and try to set them where it's ideal for the sound on the amp. And again, I've, you know, reading some forums up on this amp, some people are saying, you know, the bias really needs to be XYZ versus what the meter is showing. And so we're going to dive into that and test all that stuff out. Like I said, I've got some capacitors to replace all of these Nikicon caps, especially the ones that are in the signal path, with some nice audio note electrolytic caps. And then I got a 160 volt one for this guy here. The rest of these are 100 volt, 100 UFs. And then we're also going to replace the coupling caps. Here's some 0.33, and these are 0.22 UF uh, Mundorf aluminum oil caps. And these are some fairly reasonably priced for boutique caps, and they're compact. The MyFlex caps are so big, and I've seen people putting MyFlex caps in these things, and like they have to fill them here with long wires running over and stuff, and these should just solder right in place. So I'm not exactly sure what these Wiltison caps are actually, you know, I'm sure they don't make them. They're just sticking their little brand on them. And so who knows what those things are exactly inside. But again, that's all going to be later. The first thing we want to do is just get this amp repaired, get it up and running, and then run some baseline tests on it and kind of maybe look over what the bias current by the meter where they're recommending. And then I also want to watch the voltage across these two caps when I power it on and see if what I read online is true, that these things get overvolted as the amps coming online and really do need to be replaced, which shouldn't be a big job. So let's get to repairing this thing. Go ahead and replace the resistors on the bottom of this tube, and then we can bring this thing up on a Variac and start checking some voltages and then see how this thing performs. Okay, so we've got these resistors replaced. This is our uh, 10 ohm. We're using a one watt. And yeah, sorry about Dolly. She always likes to come in here and drink water right when I start the video. But anyway, um, we decided to go with a one watt 10 ohm. I did the calculations and this tube at max dissipation pulls about a half a watt. And so going with a one watt was two times over the max it would ever pull. And it still should act like a fuse if the tube ever red plate shorts out or something crazy happens. And these are about half the size of these resistors. And from looking at the charts online, these appear to be one watts too. And these are two watts. And then this big guy here is a three watt. So... Like I said, we're going to be replacing these with metal film resistors in a future episode, but for now, we're going to leave these metal oxide resistors in these other positions, but since I was replacing these, I went ahead and used the metal film ones we're going to end up using. This is a 1K, this is a 39K, and this is a 10 ohm. So I pulled this thing up on a Variac earlier just to kind of give it a quick test and it doesn't appear like it has damaged any of the output transformers from what I can tell. And even though it doesn't really matter when you're powering up an amp with no signal going through it, I still like to have dummy loads hooked up to the speaker jack just to be safe. And so these are the dummy loads I use. I'll put a Link in the description because I think I got these off Amazon. If not, I'll you know link somewhere where you can buy these. And I put uh, banana plugs on the end of them. And let me zoom in here and show you. So I put a banana jack on there, and then I have a little piece of copper. This is basically I think 14 gauge solid core wire for me to hook up test leads to when I'm doing my audio analyzer suite test, and then I can just plug these things into the speaker jacks. So let me plug these things in and hook up the power cord and then I want to show you what this amp does when it's turned on across these big capacitors that are rated at 450 volts. There's 460, 475, goes up to 476 volts and then the tubes start drawing current here 
So, what I saw online was right, that these caps, while they're fine for the working voltage of this amp, when you power it on before the tubes start drawing current, it goes pretty far past what they're rated at. And while most capacitors can handle that for a while, eventually it's going to end up blowing up those capacitors. And so I ordered a couple of 550 volt ones. You could probably do with 500 volt would be fine. So 450 is a little on the low side. 500 would easily deal with the voltage that this amp makes as it's warming up. So, let's check some voltages on these tubes. And again, like I said, kind of went through this amp earlier checking all these voltages to make sure that everything looked like it was working right. And it seems to be. So, got 390, 390, 390, 390. 390, 390, 390, 390. So all the tubes got the same voltages on the plates and screens, so that's a good thing. So now we're going to come in here and see what the cathode current is. And I set them all to be centered on the bias meter on the front of the amp. With the switch, you know, switch to each tube. So they should all be reading the identical millivolts on the cathodes, which should directly equal what the milliamps would be. So we got basically, basically 52, or 0 0.52, which would be 52 milliamps. 51.7. 51.8, 51.9. So probably what we're seeing here is these 10 ohm resistors are probably at best one percenters, but it looks like from the code on them, they're probably five percenters. So going to these 0.5% resistors will allow us to have a more accurate setting of the bias. So let's see what the negative voltage on the grids are. Negative 43, negative 44, negative 40, and negative 41. We do have two different kinds of output tubes in this amp right now. These are the gold lions over on this side that need negative 43 volts to get the bias pulling that current. And these Wilsonton ones need negative 40 volts to get them pulling the same milliamps. So, not surprising that these tubes are a little different than these tubes. And it's why we're going to swap the tubes between the channels when we do the audio analyzer suite to ensure that we're not seeing anything different. We may run it with the two different tubes and see if there's any difference. And then swap them from one channel to the other and see what that does. But... I'm liking what I'm seeing. I feel like that this amp is repaired, that these resistors are likely all that got toasted. And using this 10 ohm low value resistor like they did definitely was the fuse that kept this amp from burning up more parts in it and saved it from itself. So if you ever are replacing these little 10 ohm resistors on the cathode, don't think bigger is better and put like some two or three watt ones in here because you want these to act like the fuse for the tube in case it ever does red plate or something crazy happens that it doesn't smoke the rest of the amplifier. So I think we're ready to hook up the audio analyzer suite and get a baseline test on this amp before we start doing any mods to it. Okay, so now that we got the tubes in and have them all biased and everything seems to be working right again, we've got the amp ready to go. And we've got Gold Lion KT88s in the right channel, which is channel 2. And channel 1 is hooked up to these Wilsonton KT88s that it came with, which I'm not sure exactly, you know, where these things were 
made, but they, I don't know. They're probably some kind of made in China tubes. I'm not sure, but anyway, let's do a power pull on this thing and see what we've got. I've got the TSD versus power. Got the range set from a tenth of a watt to 100 watts. And got the THD set at 10% just so we can see how far this will go. We're making the pull at 1K and let's see what we get. And this first pull is going to be in triode mode. And as we can see, these gold lion tubes definitely have lower distortion, especially down here in the 1 to 2 watt range. It's we're at a half a percent distortion versus 0.175, which is that's a pretty good bit. And then when you get up here at you know one percent distortion on the gold lions, you're at one and a half percent, and we're getting 22 watts out of this amp in triode mode. So let's switch this thing over to ultra linear mode, which I'm going to guess is the way they ran this amp when they did the test on it. And this amp's advertised at 45 watts of output power. So let's see what this thing can actually produce. And here we go. And there we go. At right at 2% distortion, with the gold lion tubes anyway, it's making 46 watts. Down here at 1% distortion, we're 20 watts. But this thing's hitting the numbers that it says it is, which I'm impressed. After dealing with some of these other Chi-Fi amplifiers that aren't even close, or not even a tenth of what they advertise, this one actually hits what it's advertising. And, you know, it's not trying to claim it's 50 watts up here at, you know, spiking distortion levels. Because right about here is where, it, you know, the distortion levels just take off. And so right at 45 watts is where, you know, it really starts clipping more than likely is what's creating this really high distortion. But through this range, it's, it's good. In under 20 watts, it's under 1%. And, you know, if you're down here in this range, you know, five or six watts, somewhere in that area, you got a quarter of a percent of distortion using the gold lion tubes. These Wilsonton tubes are kind of, eh, they're clearly not the, the sharpest knife in the drawer. So the other thing, I'm going to do a quick frequency response pull and see what kind of performance we get out of these tubes on that. Looking at this frequency response, We've got a little over a half a dB of brightness here at 20K. 10K, which for a lot of people, that's kind of where their hearing kind of tapers off, and there's really not a lot of music between 10 and 20K anyway. It's only a couple of tenths of a dB of brightness, so it's probably not really that noticeable, but it does seem to kind of ramp up there. And then there's a slight bit of fall off here at 20 hertz, about a decibel. But then by 30 and 40 hertz, which is where like my clip speakers really kind of fade off anyway, it starts pretty flat all the way over to, you know, 6, 8K. So that looks really good. Now, possibly, you know, after the amp runs for a while and gets really good and warmed up, this might flatten out a little bit. Could be the driver tubes causing a little bit of this, but we may come back and do another pull on this in a later episode after letting the amp warm up for about 30 minutes. But I'm just trying to get a baseline here, of kind of the power and stuff. And I'm impressed that this is the kind of power we're seeing out of this thing. The last thing I want to do before we turn off the audio analyzer suite for this segment is run a THD versus frequency. And that'll give us an idea of the output transformer this amp has in it. And this is already looking good. We're making this pull at 8 watts into an 8 ohm load. And we're down below 1% distortion at 30 hertz, which is a sign that these are nice big output transformers that are sized correctly 
for the power of this amp and it's going to have good bass without a lot of distortion. And off camera, I'm probably going to swap the tubes from one channel to the other just to see what that does and make sure that it swaps with the tubes and that what we're seeing isn't something wrong with the amplifier itself. And this is looking really good. We sweep through the frequency here. Distortion's really low. I mean, it's below a half a percent of distortion through all of this range. And we really only see the distortion come up a little bit down below 30 hertz. But, guys, I've seen it a lot worse than this. I've seen some amps where the distortion at 20 hertz is 8 to 10 percent. And then it swoops down, you know, as it comes to 100, which is a sign that the output transformers are really not doing a good job. And this looks like these are definitely capable of doing what they need to be doing. So I'm impressed, guys. I think so far this looks like a winner. I do need to do some listening to it. And I wanted to take a look at this before I, you know, hooked it up to some speakers to make sure that everything was repaired and working right but everything looks like it's working right i don't think the output transformers got damaged when that tube red plated and we're ready to hook this thing up to some speakers and get to listen to it for a little bit well as you can see the amps advertised exactly the power that it puts out so i'm really impressed that for a made in china amp we finally got one that meets the specification that it's advertised at which is a great thing also the repair was fairly simple, and I feel like that no damage was really done to any of the components. That one watt cathode resistor did its job and acted like a fuse to protect the amp. So that's another, you know, well designed, well thought out deal on this. I know some of y'all have asked about the analog discovery too. I've done a video on it, but I'll put the link in the description with these dummy load resistors and the whole little kit. In case you all want to replicate what I've done here, put a link to the software, the Audio Analyzer Suite. Guy did a really awesome job designing that stuff. But back to this amp. This thing really sounds nice. I mean, it's got a lot of power. These Gold Lion tubes sound really good. I swapped in the pair of still good Wilsonton KT88 tubes and they just don't have the sweet sound that these Gold Lions tubes have. They seem kind of thin. They didn't have the punch that these Gold Lion tubes have. The bass seemed a little weaker. And so definitely an upgrade there. So the next step is we're going to replace those resistors. And then I'm going to replace these two big power supply caps with higher voltage ones to you know, eliminate that problem. And I really plan on doing like testing a step at a time. And I guess, too, in the next video, we may look at the frequency response curve with these tubes that I've rolled in it and see if it's flattened it out because it sounds like it has. So, probably going to have quite a few videos on this little amp. Hope you're enjoying this content. If you are, so you don't miss the future episodes on this, please subscribe to the channel. Please like the video. And we'll see you on the next round of R8 Fun. Have a great day.